We need to move away from maximalism. I view crypto maximalism similarly to religious fundamentalism, mm. right? And haven't we learned over thousands of years that isn't working for us? You know, it, yeah, it's open minds, open hearts. It's the you know willingness to agree to disagree, but uh, to respect your beliefs, you know, and to allow you to have your beliefs. They may be different than mine. You know, uh, you know, my chain is better than your chain. My coin is better than your coin. My religion is better than your. That again, I don't think that that's the answer. I think that we need to migrate into you know an abundance you know sort of mindset. You know, a coopetition. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to season two of Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And we are here live at the CC Forum, just came out with a crazy debate, probably one of the craziest of all time with some of the legends in this space. And speaking of legends, we're here today with no one else than Brock Pierce. A pleasure to have you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That was a crazy debate. But before jumping into that, Brock, I'd love to simply ask you, you have an amazing past. Uh, and something that's really interesting is the fact that you were already a part of Hollywood, which is the wildest dream for many people out there. But instead of going down that route, you completely steered to a different direction and started ending up being one of the prominent fingers in the decentralized space. So if you don't mind telling us, you know, how do you go from everyone's dream to going for something a bit more risky, a bit more out there? That'd be amazing. Well, I mean, I, I think the lesson is that we, we have the power to reinvent ourselves at any point in our lives. You know, as long as you're willing to take the leap, right? Willing to take the risk. Um, you know, and so in, in my case, yeah, I grew up as an actor from the ages of three to 16. You know, I had the, uh, uh, the great privilege uh, to, to star in movies. And uh, it's also a good habit uh, to quit while you're ahead. Uh, and so I, I threw in the towel and quit acting at the height of my career because I was like, oh, I want to go do something different. Uh, much to my agent and manager's dismay. You know? <laughs> They're like, we, 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 we got the golden goose and the golden goose what you says it doesn't want to lay eggs anymore. What? <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I, I, I decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And uh, to me at the time, that was to, to start producing. And so I didn't want to be the actor anymore. I wanted to be the producer. And then that led me down an entrepreneurial journey uh, you know, across other industries and eventually found myself here. That is so cool. That's so cool. Was there anything in particular that made you think Bitcoin, obviously you, you were very involved with Bitcoin in the early days. Was there anything that really caught your heart and your spirit and felt like this is the right way for me or? Well, yeah, I mean, my, my, my life story has largely been a story of digital currency. Um, and so I was a, a, an avid gamer in, in, in my youth. And uh, even in elementary school, I was buying and selling gaming software and things of that nature. And then I was, uh, very active in the collectible card game, you know, sort of world. I was an early Magic the Gathering player. Oh, and, yeah, I uh, that. And then all the, you know, sort of the Pokemon, you know, sort of world and collecting Star, you know, Star Trek collectibles and things of that nature. So I was a, a, a secondary market sort of uh, aficionado, aficionado. And then uh, I started playing some of the early networked games. And so I started buying and selling digital assets inside of games back in the late 90s. And I was a market maker. And then as massively multiplayer games emerged like Ultima Online, EverQuest, eventually things like World of Warcraft and Second Life, I'd become the largest market maker in the world, or we had uh, uh, one of the companies I started. And uh, yeah, we built up a supply chain in, the early, in my you know, early to mid 20s of 400,000 people in China that were playing video games professionally to mine digital currencies. We were PayPal's largest merchant for years, uh, Google's largest advertiser for a little while. So I'd been in cross-border payments and mining of currencies and market making uh, for many, many years uh, in the gaming world prior to Bitcoin. That's absolutely fascinating. And, and one thing that you bring up, Brock, which is really interesting, I remember at one of your keynotes, you talked about how gaming could be one of the disrupting industries 
for blockchain and you were very passionate about it. And it's really interesting because, for example, Grand Theft Auto 5, I believe, generated more revenue than any movie in the history of entertainment. So clearly the gaming world is becoming really vibrant, VR, AR, it's becoming more and more realistic. Do you still believe that gaming dApps or that will be one of the driving forces to the cryptocurrency space? Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and that's, you know, I went from movies, right, to, to and video kind of based entertainment and music to gaming. And that was as I, you know, uh, as I was going through my entrepreneurial learnings, you know, I kind of look at the entertainment industry as a three-legged stool, right? You've got video, music, games. And what I learned is if you want to be successful in business, one of the most important things is to be in a growing industry. And so uh, uh, the entertainment world I had grown up in was flat, uh, essentially, and gaming is, you know, interactive entertainment, you know, kind of the holy grail of what we talked about wasn't in watching a television show where you pick your own ending or a movie where you pick your own ending. It's linear content, right? But uh, in, in interactive content is what we always talked about. And, and then I'm like, wait, gaming is interactive entertainment. Uh, and it's continued to be a high growth industry. Uh, and so, yeah, games have, have always been very exciting. Uh, I think, um, you know, take a look at what industries have driven technology adoption historically, right? Gaming has been one of the primary drivers of adoption of technology, you know, whether that be video game consoles, you know, whether that be computers, whether that be phones, you know, one of the main use cases of, you know, all of these technologies has been games. So uh, uh, it's my expectation, you know, I think it's safe to assume that gaming will be one of the primary drivers uh, for blockchain, you know, sort of adoption as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's, it's been the case for every other technology sort of revolution. So I would expect it to play a, a meaningful role in this one. And it already has been, um, you know, most of call it Bitcoin adoption has come from gaming. You know, most of the uh, uh, the early adopters of, of cryptocurrencies, you know, were online gamers. You know, what are the largest cryptocurrency markets in the world? China, South Korea, on a, certainly on a, a per capita basis, you know, Korea is the most important. Why? Because that was the mecca of the online games business. Oh, what? You know, it? China. Well, yeah, you could, there's a direct correlation between cryptocurrency adoption and gaming adoption. Because those people that have played games and have recognized that intangible assets inside of games have value, you know, were the first ones to recognize that something like Bitcoin might have value because, you know, there was no learning curve, right? Yeah. And so that's one of the things that we've seen. There's a, a direct correlation between gaming and, and sort of cryptocurrency adoption. So would you love to see like one of these big gaming manufacturing companies or developing companies such as Square Enix or Rockstar? Would you like them to get involved and start making decentralized apps or gaming or should we just do it by ourselves through the community? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 unfortunately, you're probably that's not where we're likely to see most of it from. You know, I've been in the, the games industry. I mean, every probably possible version of it. Uh, you know, from hardcore to casual, from media to, you know, development, publishing, secondary markets, exchanges. I've done kind of everything one can do in gaming. And what you'll notice is, you know, people that go from making, you know, ca uh, uh, console games normally don't migrate well to PC games or don't migrate well to casual games. Um, and so... Uh, the traditional sort of big box game companies are not likely going to be the ones that innovate in this area. Uh, the innovation is likely to come from you know, a new uh, breed of entrepreneurs, but we're seeing it right now. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, interesting game development occurring. Obviously, we've seen it with gambling games, right? You know, whether it be Satoshi Dice, you know, the first dApps, the first applications that have driven cryptocurrency adoption were gaming you know, but principally gambling apps. So it's going to start with simple stuff because the, you know, call it cryptocurrencies and blockchains don't really scale. You're not going to see it through the grand theft auto type of content initially. It's going to be simple, uh, simple games with simple game mechanics because the infrastructure isn't there yet. Uh, that's a really good point. And speaking of infrastructure, you obviously with EOS and Block One, one It'll be collectible card game type stuff. Collectible card games. You know, I'm uh, super excited for like Magic the Gathering type of games. I think that's where we're going to see this first wave of uh, uh, adoption. And it's, that's a really good point. And talking about infrastructure, so obviously you wanted to contribute to the ecosystem. You wanted you helped with Block One and developed EOS. And 
Do you think that as of today, our technology is good enough for someone to be able to go from one game, send their collectibles to another game, and literally create their own universe? Or, or do we still have a few limitations as of today? Yeah, I don't think we're going to see much of that per se. Um, because the, historically, the game companies you know, want to create a walled garden. They want to create a high switching cost. They do not want it to be easy for you to migrate from one game to the other. You know, the goal is to build a moat around their user base. Stay within my structure. Don't well, that's, leave. Yeah, you don't want to make the switching cost easy, right? You know, same thing cell phone companies did with making it hard to port your number until laws changed. You know, but there'll be a new, uh, 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 you know, you'll start to see companies partner so that this game makes it easy to migrate to this game because they've, you know, they're creating alliances. Um, but most of it's going to, you know, the secondary market is you sell your goods in this game to then go buy them in the other game, and typically you're switching to U.S. dollars or Bitcoin or something of that nature. Uh, uh, normally, it won't be from you know, this in-game asset to this in-game asset across worlds, across digital universes. That's really interesting. And does that mean that in that space, so collaboration over competition, there's a lot of fighting on the panel as well. As of now, we saw a lot of fighting, and you seem to have like such an open mindset and being super flexible based on the remarks you're making, but is that what we're struggling with right now in terms of the evolution? Do you feel like there's too much rivalry, tribalism, maximalism, and all these phenomenons that are putting roadblocks? Or is that just nature? Yeah. Well, no, absolutely. I think this is you know, one of the main things that as a species, we have to change if we wish to survive. You know, We have to get ourselves out of this competition or scarcity mindset. You know, We need to move away from that maximalism. I view crypto maximalism similarly to religious fundamentalism, mm. right? And haven't we learned over thousands of years that isn't working for us? You know, it, yeah, it's open minds, open hearts. It's the you know, willingness to agree to disagree, but uh, to respect your beliefs, you know, and to allow you to have your beliefs. They may be different than mine. You know, uh, you know, my chain is better than your chain. My coin is better than your coin. My religion is better than your. That, again, I don't think that that's the answer. I think that we need to migrate into you know an abundance you know sort of mindset. You know, a co-opetition, co right? Yeah. Where we recognize that it's all innovation, and you may end up delivering the solution that makes life better for all of us. And so I should be encouraging you to innovate. You know, you might be the key. You might bring the solution. I know it's, we all want to say it's me, 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 and I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. But Capitalistic mindset. Yeah. Right? I'm better you know, uh, conscious capitalism is conscious where capitalism. You know, we need to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, but this is back to capitalism, socialism, communism, anarchy. Uh, uh, they're all right in some way, but they're all wrong, yeah. right? I mean, capitalism uh, creates an economic incentive which motivates us to do things, but unbridled capitalism has you know operated under the assumption that we had unlimited resources which we don't and capitalism has gotten us this far but it will ultimately destroy us if we continued to have unbridled capitalism we have to have conscious capitalism and this is where you know communism was a great idea in the sense that okay let's take make sure that everyone's taken care of but the problem is it didn't provide for any incentive any motivation uh which you know this is you know back to and anarchy, again, the, the, the same sort of idea that, uh, you know, we should all be free. You know, there, there, there's great truths and wonderful concepts in all of them, you know, but they're all wrong in their own way. And what we need to find is, you know, that, that ultimate truth, which is probably an aggregation of all of these ideas, because they all have something to contribute. I like to think of, you know, each and every one of us as being a piece of a puzzle. And the great work is ultimately in the mosaic of all of us, you know, coming together and learning how to work together. Because we all have something unique to offer, you know, something unique to contribute. And thank God we're all different. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And you were definitely different on the panel as well. Like your open mind. I'm more of a lover than a fighter. Yeah, you're definitely a lover. <laughs> that, was a, that, that, was a, that was a panel of fighters. <laughs> and, and, and ready to, you know, all fight for their beliefs. That it was, you know, I'm more like, why can't we all just get along? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of which, you almost got a standing ovation when you, it was in incredible because of, uh, there's so much hatred in this space and you actually showed a little bit of love to one of people's, you know, enemy, as people like to call him, Craig Wright. 
And do you mind telling us of what you said on the stage and saying, you know, if Craig Wright would be his feet, da da da. You said well, something. Well, I mean, which... yeah, yeah, but in the, and and based upon what was on Twitter today, it's it's kind of disturbing how quickly people get themselves into this mindset, right, of hate or anger, and forget the underlying philosophy of you know what has brought most of us to this space. You know, a lot of people believe you know one aspect of crypto, and not everybody believes this, but one of the you know the attributes of this industry is censorship resistance, right? And at the same time, those people want to see Craig Wright censored. It's very hypocritical, right? You know, it's back to freedom of speech. You know, you don't have to listen to what he has to say. You don't have to follow him. You can block him. But the idea that, you know, this person isn't, you know, allowed to speak, uh, is, is, it, it goes against what many of us to believe, you know, believe to be one of the underlying principles or philosophies of this industry. And how quickly we forget once we're triggered you know, with that, uh, that emotional response. And, uh, you know, I like to honor everyone that is taking the time to contribute. You know, we are all Satoshi. We all have the, the potential to contribute. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin SV is by market cap, indisputably one of the leading innovations in the space. You, whether you love it or hate it, you know, it's indisputable by market cap and market participation that it is a contender. You know, it has potential. Whether you like that answer or not, yeah. it's a fact. Yeah. Now you can deny it, you know, potentially to your own peril. Um, you know, I, 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 I choose to maintain an open mind and I choose to know that I know what that I don't know. And I know I don't know a lot. And I am not going to close myself off from, you know, listening to anything, you know, and, and Craig gets a, a, you know, has clearly been a, a, a contributor when, you know, whether you agree or believe when he got into the space and what, how he's contributed, there's, you know, no doubt that he is a major contributor to the ecosystem today, though very controversial, a lot like Trump, yeah. you know, in some ways, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, you know, uh, you know he, I, I'd argue he's kind of our, the Donald Trump of our industry in the sense that he triggers people very similarly. Right. He gets people very upset in the same way that, you know, Trump upsets a lot of people. Uh, but that doesn't mean, you know, he doesn't have an important role to play. Uh, and I choose to, to listen to everyone, and including Noriel. I agree with most of what Noriel has to say. I agree that, you know, 90 to 99% of, you know, the altcoins out there are shitcoins and probably won't be around in the next few years. You know, very similar to, to the internet in 1999. And I agree with him that the US dollar is still the most desired, you know, currency in the world. Just like in 1999, 99% of the internet startups failed and probably 90 to 99% of the crypto projects are also going to fail and most of them are shit coins. Though we did get eBay, we did get Amazon, things did come out of the internet that still benefit us today. You know, the one area where we differ is I do believe that the work that we're doing here is going to deliver long-term positive implications. Where I disagree with many is I don't know where that innovation is going to come from. All of these experiments are iterative tests. And if anyone succeeds in making the world a better place, we all win, which is why I encourage Craig Wright and everybody else to continue to innovate because we don't know where the answer is going to come from. And anyone that thinks they knows the answer today very well could be wrong. Lovely. I mean, if we go out and do a poll, you know, and we offer people $100 with a Bitcoin or $100 in cash, the vast majority of people are still going to take the USD. USD. <laughs> it's yeah. indisputable. That doesn't mean that that's what the future holds, but that is the present fact. And this is where, you know, Noriel and I might disagree, you know, as he speaks of our industry based upon, you know, the current state of the union. You know, I'm an innovator you know, and an entrepreneur. And so I don't look at the market for what it is today. I look at the market of what, you know, as, you know, in terms of what it can be tomorrow and, you know, what that future outlook is. You know, and he's assessing us for, for where we are today, but most of his assessments are right. Yes, it doesn't scale today. It doesn't, you know, Noriel's mostly right. The only, the only area where, you know, uh, I don't think he maintains an open mind right now is that he doesn't think that there's any future for this stuff. Yeah. But that's also, you know, that's his position, right? I mean, 
It's a character, right? And, but, <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, that's his character type, right? You know, uh, and if he didn't take that position, he wouldn't be paid to speak in all these places. He wouldn't be honored with the, you know, the stage. You know, you know, we all play our role, you know, in this, in this great play. I feel like Nouriel is slightly getting more open to Bitcoin. Did you hear what he said at the end? Bitcoin is maybe partially a store of value. Right. That's something that never came out of his mouth before, right? He's learning as right. he goes. And, and yeah. this is back to uh, um, how we engage with people. You know, Noriel and I have engaged with each other, you know, you know, many times. I mean, even at the end of the panel, great to, to see you, Brock. Uh, I've spent, I, I spend a fair amount of time with him. Um, and we can be much more effective in engaging with others when we treat people with respect. And when we, and we take the time to listen to what they have to say, to try and understand their perspective. You know, this is one of, again, the problems in the world that we have today is that we live in a world that's becoming so polarizing that we don't listen to each other. We don't treat each other with respect and dignity. We can agree to disagree, but we should at least try to take the time to listen to someone else's perspective and to understand where they're coming from. You know, this is what we're seeing in the world today is, I mean, the left versus the right. They're not even willing to engage in civil discourse. You know, uh, uh, it, it, it's scary how uh, uh, we treat each other. I mean, it's, it's this type of behavior that leads to really bad outcomes. You know, uh, ultimately you don't reach consensus. You don't reach compromise, you know, when we're yelling at each other. That's so beautiful. Intellectual How debate <laughs> intellectual is, you know, debate. important. That was an intellectual debate. So many angles, so many perspectives. But better if, better if we're, I mean, it's less entertaining. Let, let, yeah, less entertaining. You know, but we're not supposed to be like living in the Coliseum, right? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, we're, we're in England, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to be, you know, uh, polite. <laughs> You know, we can agree and we can, st and, and, and the British are the best in terms of, you know, they can still have their zingers in there, but they, they do it, you know, in a, uh, uh, you know, in a, a very gentle uh, uh, sort of fashion. Beautifully put. And it's really, when I, when I saw you on the panel, when I see you now, and even when I saw you in Japan, it's, I feel like you're always thinking of the greater good. You're always thinking about the bigger picture, you know, I don't care about this drama, this drama, what is good for mankind and stuff like that. And just earlier, we were talking a little bit about the recent withdrawals from the Facebook project, the Libra coin. And a lot of people, they're like, ah, good for you. You know, PayPal left you, this, this company left you, you guys are losing one leg, you'll probably end up failing. But even you as someone with open mindset who said to, to Craig Wright, if you find a solution that's good for mankind, let's take it, let's accept it. How do you feel about the, the Libra coin thing? Do you think we're being a little bit unfair or does it make sense to? Uh, yeah, of course we're being unfair. I mean, again, let's take a step back. Always try to find the silver lining, right? It's very easy to get emotional and to feel threatened. Um, and, you know, that's kind of your, your, your almost lesser, you know, reptilian almost instincts reacting. Instead, try to be that, you know, higher consciousness, that, that elevated operate kind of from a heart space. And so let's talk about Libra, right? Facebook probably has the best distribution of any you know, company on the planet today, right? Any organization on earth. And Facebook is a fan of cryptocurrencies and blockchains, and we can debate what that means. But, and the fact that they're willing to roll out something they think you know, has a potential. So I mean, Facebook clearly, I think indisputably, arguably indisputably, has the potential to drive cryptocurrency adoption more so than any other organization on the planet. That's probably a good thing. You know, we've spent 10 years, you know, working on this stuff and, you know, we haven't delivered much in the way of distribution, you know, compared to the, you know, call it the size of the, the pie that's out there. Um, and I think anything that drives adoption is good for us. So I think, uh, uh, you know, Facebook is going to drive adoption. Now, some people might say, oh, I don't trust yeah, Facebook, yeah. right? I don't trust Facebook. I don't trust them with my, 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 in, my uh, digital DNA. I certainly don't trust them with my wallet. Some people might make that argument, and they're somewhat justified. You know, Facebook doesn't have a perfect uh, you know, track record of you know, having always been you know, represented uh, their users uh, uh, perfectly. So I think that, that some of those concerns are justified. But then ultimately, the choice is ours, right? They may drive adoption, 
And anything that drives adoption and puts people, you know, into this ecosystem, I think is, is, is a good thing. And then we, the people, will ultimately decide which flavor, you know, of, of crypto, cryptocurrency we ultimately want. But I think anything that drives adoption is good for all of us. Is that really the, the big why? Is it just giving equal rights to everyone or an, an option to everyone? Is, is that what this is all about, if you had to put it in one phrase? Well, well I mean, it's also another great thing, too. They're taking all of our arrows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Facebook is clearly, you know, uh, at a time where we're seeing, you know, intensity, you know, amongst government regulators and all that sort of stuff, right? It's heating up. And, uh, you know, Facebook is clearly like, you know, deflecting a lot of, you know, shots that might be taking it, being taken at us and, you know, some of our, you know, the other entrepreneurs in this space. And, you know, most of the arrows are, you know, being shot at Facebook. So, you know, kind of thank them for, you know, being that giant <laughs> magnet. Um, Taking one for the team. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, again, there's, there's a bunch of, and again, we don't know. We don't know if something is a good or a bad thing until we have the benefit of yeah, hindsight, right? That's true. You know, you're, what you think today might be the best day of your life because something great happened to you. You might find out 10 years from now it ended up actually being the worst thing that ever happened to you. And, and that, you know, today you find out the worst thing that could have ever happened to you. You may find out 10 years from now that that was actually the best thing that ever happened to you. You don't really know until you have the benefit of hindsight whether something is good or bad. And so uh, uh, I try not to uh, form judgments quickly. Instead, I try to keep an open mind. Open and mind. look for the good things. Look, yeah. look for the good in everything. Definitely, you're really good at finding those good moments and, and avoiding all the judgments and you know, quickly drawn conclusions and all the the, the stuff that might hurt know. us. Right? <laughs> you're good at it. <laughs> I do. I don't know. Uh, first to admit it. <laughs> you were so chill. People were attacking you on the stage, and you're just smiling and chill and like, oh, this doesn't offend me. It's okay. It's it's part of the fun. It's well, it's it's you know. <laughs> It's all entertaining. It's all entertaining, definitely. Yeah. And if you're not having fun, if you're not laughing enough, you know, you should probably reflect on that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. You were just talking about the future, and and I know in Malta you gave a talk about uh, token economics, and obviously here you're saying that it's Nuriel's maybe right. Ninety-five to ninety-nine percent of tokens may go to zero. That was the same in the dot, dot com bubble. But then in Malta you also talked about how new asset classes may join this space and why you felt it's really important. Do you mind telling us a little bit of how you would see, if you had that back to the future DeLorean, you know, what would you see in the future if you had to jump on one of those cars? Well, I mean, this is where Noriel and I might disagree um, and, and, and potentially some others. I am a believer, you know, in blockchain technology. I believe that the, you know, the blockchain is gonna deliver a larger impact on the world than the internet has, probably by an order of magnitude or more. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer. No, I could be wrong again, but I, I'm a believer, which is why I vote with my time. And this is what I spend my time doing. And uh, you know, I believe that we're gonna watch all the world's currencies eventually get tokenized, you know, whether they be government issued or you know, math based, right? Um, I believe that we're gonna see all of the world's bond markets eventually get tokenized. I think we're gonna see all of the world's stocks, you know, or equities get tokenized uh, because I believe it delivers long term. You know, again, we have to hit scale first, but we're starting to get there. We're in our, call it blockchain, you know, generation three or third generation, you know, systems and fourth gen will come. But I believe we're getting there. I mean, we're starting to see that potential is becoming clear. Uh, and I think that, you know, in terms of efficiency, security, immutability, you know, transparency, all of these things, depending upon what system, you know, I think, I think it's, it's clear to me that that's going to happen to everything. And so that was one of the things that I was, was talking about there in Malta is how, uh, you know, this is going to be a massive, you know, massive, massive industry. Uh, and we're still very, very early days. That makes a lot of sense. And to be you honest, know, people are like, am I too late? <laughs> You know, I, I think if anything, you still might be too early. You might be too early. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the good news that's for exactly anyone. What I say. And, and, you know, for yeah. anyone that's just you know paying attention and feel like you may have missed the boat. Uh, one of the things I think I talked about is the stock market. Back to the internet. Yeah. The you know the tech stocks in 1999 got to an aggregate market cap of 6.7 trillion. Oh yeah, you mentioned that. In the yeah, the market cap right. of cryptocurrencies is like 200 billion, yeah. and that was when you know the, the tech stocks were almost an entirely Western phenomenon. That's not inflation adjusted either. 
I think I could make an argument with quantitative easing and everything else that was like, you know, some of what we talked about today, that that would have been the equivalent of 50 or 100 trillion. We're only at about 200 billion today. You know, meaning we're only at, you know, call it two to 4% of what the internet industry was at in 1999. That puts things Which means it's very potentially early days. You know, if any of my, you know, thesis is right, right? I said that I think this might be 10 times bigger than the internet. You know, when you start thinking about it from that perspective, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And it's still very early days. And again, Noriel is right. We're, at, we're still in a prototyping phase. You know, uh, it's still theoretical. Beautifully said. And you know what, like, when you talk about all the assets on the blockchain, people are like, no, there's no demand for it. But when you think about secondary markets, that transferability on a peer-to-peer -peer level, if I can buy a, a stock of one company and just give it to my daughter and make sure I can transfer it without intermediaries, isn't that a beautiful thing? That just simple transferability on any corners of the planet. Do, isn't that, doesn't that make a good enough reason on why we should have all these assets? Well, yeah, well great efficiency, right? I mean, we live in a world filled with toll takers. You know, the, 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 the system has been, you know, designed to enrich intermediaries who sometimes are adding value and more often than not, not so much. They're there, you know, to, it's value extraction, right? It's back to scarcity versus abundance. You have a lot, you know, we live in a, 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 a world economy where so much of it is about extraction, you know, versus addition, right? How do we add value uh, uh, to the transactions or our interactions with others? That's fantastic. Being following you today and through all your talks has been absolutely amazing, Brock. You, you're really contributing so much for wherever I see you, tons of great information. And I really hope that all the viewers out there just see how open-minded you are and see the lover in Brock and, and just really understanding that we need to change our mindset. We can't always fight, you know, get into conflict and collaborate and help hope that someone succeeds and brings back to mankind. So. Thank you. Thank you so what much. What a wonderful uh, fireside <laughs> chat. <laughs> well, where should we follow you, Brock? Like if someone wants to get in touch with you, are you more active on Twitter, YouTube? Yeah, I'm, I'm not active best? enough anywhere, but I'm active everywhere, right? Uh, mostly because I'm just spread thin and very busy. But uh, yeah, on Twitter, you can find me at Brock Pierce. It's just my name in uh, one word, uh, at Brock Pierce. You can uh, YouTube. We have a, a channel and I've been making more and more content lately, which is uh, the, Brock uh, the, channel. the channel is Brock Chain. Yeah, Brock Chain. Yeah. <laughs> Brock Chain. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm everywhere. It's just, you know, uh, trying to uh, uh, share as much as I can. I really Always. hope people take it in and, and really follow your mindset because we need that in space. Thank you so much, my friend, for coming in. Definitely come back to Crypto next, next time you're in London. We should definitely have you and hopefully really uh, get people to, to understand what this is all about. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification. If you have any comments or questions for Brock, please put them in the comment section below, and we'll try to get back to you with an answer as soon as we can. And thank you so much, and see you next week, premiering every Wednesday at eight o'clock UK time, Kryptonites season two. Thank you very much.